Thanks for having us out here. Your garden is beautiful. Well, thank you. I enjoy it. It is a beautiful piece of land and uh, we've been, you know, I've been working on it. it. It used to be covered with ivy, but somebody gardened here years ago, but I just love it with the stream and the huge trees. It's beautiful. Yeah, here we are right on the cusp of spring. Things are starting to grow. We've got beautiful boxwoods here. How do you go about uh, pruning a knot garden like this with this boxwood? Well, luckily these are never, these particular boxwoods are never going to be more than two feet tall, but they do need a shearing. I don't like to shear at this time of year because, you know, we're still kind of in winter and those, we could have a really low temperature at night and those leaves would say, yeah, you cut me halfway off. I will now turn brown at the edge. So I actually reach in and go for something, you know, if it's something's out of place and I just, you know, put some air in it that way with my pruners really fast. Later in the year, I would to make this really tighter. Got you. We've just passed an area of the garden that needs to be cut back for winter and you've left it deliberately long uh, until the plants have started growing in the spring. Why did you do that? It's so different than the way I was trained to garden and that I used to garden, but the, the longer you can leave things, dead perennials, leaves, even sticks, although I do get a little weary of them, the, the better you have habitat for the little bugs native and otherwise, I suppose, I'm, I'm not controlling who's living here, sure. but I want more native habitat and I can leave those hollow stems, for instance, all those sedums over there. I mean, there could be a lot of native um, bees that are that are just hunkering down and, um, and waiting to wake up in spring. And I know we had a lot of damage back early in the winter. So how do you go about kind of pruning for those conditions? How do you address that after the fact? You know, you have to remember that Mother Nature doesn't have anything like this. And so, you know, these damaging things will happen to these trees and they will survive. But if there's something that you really care about on your property, it's great to go ahead and take that ripped cut or that jagged thing that happened in that storm and make a clean cut. So yeah, we lost a tree. We lost some big branches off of some trees. In fact, there's a little Carolina cypress down there that we lost the leader off of. Mm. And so I have an arborist um, who was, I was talking with her about it and, and she said, yes, the leader's gone. That means we're not going up anymore. She said, this will be sort of a medium sized bonsai tree. Enjoy. And I love to prune, so that's fine. <laughs> nice, that's great. So I see we've got some obviously smaller boxwood here, and then we've got some larger specimens. How would you approach pruning these differently? Well, they have been severely pruned. They were twice as tall when I first moved here, but I wanted to sit on the terrace that's there and look out into the yard. So I took them down to sticks. You know, they call that a rejuvenation pruning. Sure. And they bounce back really nicely. Right now, it's probably time for me to do some thinning cuts on them. So these are very slow growing, the English boxwood. And what happens is they grow on the outside. I do like to shear them into these green meatballs because that's the look I want. They don't need this. Very little pruning actually has to be done. It's my control that I want to impose on my garden. I'm having fun with it. Sure. But a good thing to do with boxwood is to reach in and prune something like that. And you actually create a hole. It looks kind of silly unless you make a series of them and then you've got a pattern and then it looks intentional. Nice. So also you're doing that, of course, to increase airflow and to combat disease and different things, right? Yeah, exactly. We had a really bad period of the blight a few years ago. I never got it. And we did have a drought last year, which makes the blight sort of go you know, to the back burner. But that could happen. And if you really care about your boxwoods, they're just such a popular plant here in Virginia. Air circulation is really going to help combat that. Excellent. Well, thanks for showing us how you go about approaching your formal garden. Let's go ahead and take a look at more of the informal sections of your garden. Okay, let's have a look. Come on, there's a lot. And in fact, I have a ton of hydrangeas back there and we can talk about how or when to prune different types. We're very lucky to have the water feature. It's just a stream that was already going through the neighborhood. We borrow it, recycle the water so that it gurgles a little bit and doesn't you know, hatch so many mosquitoes. Yeah. And then it uh, goes along its way. And you've got, of course, these foundational trees here um, that have obviously been here a a Great, long, long time. Long time. Yeah, we figured this must have been a pretty tight forest because the tulip poplars and even the oaks are so vertical. And of course, mm. I've limbed them up for more light in my garden. Sure. And you also have uh, some snags in here as well. Yeah. So you know what they say, when a tree dies, everything else starts to live. Yeah, and so yeah. it could be dangerous to have a dead tree on your property, but they do a pull test on them every year to make sure that they're steady and they host tons of wildlife. That's excellent. And that brings up safety in the garden. That's one of the main reasons to prune, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one thing to have a dead and ugly branch that's just bothering your aesthetic quality of the garden, but there's another one to have you know, a dead branch that weighs 200 pounds and it could kill you. So you have to have the arborist come and remove those things. You, you must have safety. Yeah. So we're approaching hydrangea alley here, huh? So many hydrangeas. Yeah. And I have a real concentration of types 
right here for you. Mm -hmm. Nice, great. Yeah, so we have four different types. Way over there is the oak leaf. That doesn't need any attention from me at all. And in fact, most of these don't. But it just seems like at this time of year, it just feels a little funny to see something like that. You know, we're ready for bright and green and spring. So you can take away a lot of this. Oak leaf, I would simply take away the dead flowers. This is a, um, a native arborescence, the Annabelle. I would go down way down to like six inches okay. because it's going to bloom on new wood. Same for the paniculata type. I'd go, I'd take most of these branches away and any skinny branches that would be too skinny to support a flower well. Mm -hmm. But the macrophylla, no, no, no. They bloom on old wood. That means if I prune this hard now, all those flowers will be gone. And yet I don't really want to look at this, this sure. old flower. So I'll find the next bud that looks like it might have been fried in the snow the other day. <laughs> but we're being optimistic and we'll just prune right in front of that. And, and now, you know, I was happy to look at that all winter, but I'm done now. Yeah, it's a great demonstration on how to approach different species of plants. I'm just wondering if there are tips for approaching spring blooming uh, plants versus fall and summer blooming plants. Yes, and it's pretty easy if you just think like the plant. If you're a spring shrub that's about to bloom, you just want to say, okay, just let me do my thing. And then after I'm done blooming, if I need to be pruned, that's when you do me because I will have time to form new buds for next year's flowers all summer and all fall. Whereas if I'm a fall blooming shrub, then I just want to, I just want to do my show in the fall, sit tight all fall. You know, Keith, when you prune any sort of plant. It's like telling the plant to grow. And so if you can avoid any kind of pruning right before like really tough winter temperatures, mm -hmm. that's a great idea. It just gives that plant a little bit of a break away from the stress that it would have. So for those fall blooming shrubs, the great time to prune them is early spring. It has time to form those buds for flowers all summer long. Yeah, that's great. Are there any other general tips that you uh, use or guidelines that you go by when you're thinking about pruning? Yeah, I would say that one thing that people can keep in mind, and this isn't, isn't hard and fast, but it's a great just rule of thumb. If you have something that's completely overgrown and you're afraid of stressing it out, think about taking away a third of the plant at a time. Now, you could cut it down to nubbins and say, you know what, I didn't really like you anyway. So if you grow back, <laughs> fantastic. But if you don't, I'll shop. But if you really care about that plant, you want to give it a good chance, take a third away, let it recover for a year, take another third away, and gradually it'll get back to what you want it to be. Yeah, well, you are so full of great tips and ideas. This has been a really informative experience. We've learned so much and you're quite an educator. How can we learn more and follow you? Well, it's easy because I just love to talk about gardening. I call it garden explaining. Um, and you can go to my website and I also have a weekly podcast called Into the Garden with Leslie. So thanks for coming over, Keith. Yeah, thanks so much.